So in terms of the format, we'll hear from today's speakers first and after, which will open up the floor for discussion and any questions you might have. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. Uh, Leah Weber, who is presenting today for Claire Ma, and Emma Liu, who will be presenting on the utilization of operations research to improve the quality of oncology care. Emma and Claire work with uh, as operations research analysts with the CIHR-funded operations research in cancer care team, and they are at the BC Cancer Agency Research Center. And Leah is an operations research scientist with the team. And they've worked on important research that has really changed the way that care is being delivered here at the BC Cancer Agency, and we're delighted they can be here with us today. So I will hand it off now to Leah and Emma. <coughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Leah Weber. I'll be presenting on behalf of Claire Ma today, who's been a little bit under the weather, but she is here today with us to answer some questions on her research. Uh, also with me is my co-presenter, Emma Liu, and we'll be t talking about improving access to quality cancer care through optimized oncologist practice patterns and patient appointment scheduling. So today we're specifically going to be talking about two separate case studies we did at the Beach Cancer Agency, and then we'll be talking about how we hope to link them together in, in our future research. So who are we? As Angela said, we call ourselves the ORIC team, and that stands for Operations Research for Improved Cancer Care. And our team consists of a unique collaboration between uh, practitioners, oncologists, and administrators at the BC Cancer Agency, and faculty researchers and students at the University of British Columbia Sider School of Business. So at the intersection of these two organizations sits our research team, uh, which we call the ORIC team. And the mission of our team is to improve the efficiency of the cancer care system and thereby enhance patient outcomes. So at this point, you're probably wondering, what is operations research? I guess we've said this term a few times already. So I just want to briefly go over what this actually is. So operations research is the application of advanced analytical methods to improve decision making. And it's sometimes referred to as the science of better. And what that means is we're, all, we're constantly trying to figure out ways to improve the efficiency of operations and help managers and executives make better decisions uh, with more information. And we use a number of techniques in operations research, and here's some of the more popular techniques. Uh, the one I'm going to be talking most about today is simulation, and we'll go into a little bit more detail as to what that actually is later on. However, despite how complicated or uh, the amount of math that you see up there, operations research in, in our line of work really boils down to two main problems. And those are trying to match supply and demand, Whereas demand for us means uh, patient demand for cancer services, and supply means resources with which we provide this cancer care, such as oncologists, nurses, and pharmacists, et cetera. And we also deal a lot with scheduling problems. How can we schedule things in the most efficient manner as possible? Uh, some past projects that we worked on is chemotherapy scheduling, and we're also hoping to address radiation therapy scheduling in the future as well. So I just briefly want to cover some important definitions and terms that you're going to hear throughout the presentation, just so everybody's on the same page. And the first one is practice patterns. And essentially what this is, is the, um, the number and frequency of appointments and oncology treatments associated with an oncologist for different types of patients. So it's essentially uh, how often and how frequent uh, patients are followed and who is actually following these patients through their treatment. We're also going to be talking about patient appointment scheduling. And that's simply just the process of assigning patients to both an oncologist and a specific time slot. And we're going to be using the term follow-up a lot today. And I just want to make this very clear how we define follow-up in our particular research. So when we say follow-up, we're referring to any appointment after the initial new patient consultation. So we're including uh, both appointments during treatment and both follow-up appointments post-treatment and when we're using the term follow-up. And then lastly, practice size. And this just refers to um, the total practice size of an oncologist. So it includes their new patients, patients who are currently on treatment, and patients who the physician is following post-treatment. 
So here's a big picture research problem that our team is currently looking at. And it all began when one of our centers was experiencing long wait times for new patient consultations. So we started looking at this problem, and at first the obvious solution seemed to us that, well, if you don't have enough um, capacity to see all your new patients, you'll just, if you just increase your oncologist availability through adding more new patient slots, that'll help balance the supply and demand. But then uh, after we brought this up with executives, they said, well, wait a second, we also have to consider what happens downstream of that? So if we increase availability for new patient consults by adding more new patient consultation slots, essentially what that's going to do is going to increase the practice size for the oncologist and therefore create lots more downstream work. And so by creating this downstream work, what's going to happen is it's going to make it more difficult for our oncologists to then be able to see new patients. And then also another effect of this is we have to consider the quality of care and, the, and as well as patient safety when oncologist practice sizes are becoming quite large and they have lots more downstream work. So here are some of the research questions that we're hoping to address. So we want to look at uh, efficient scheduling. So we want to look at what oncologist should we book to and when should that slot be booked. And then we also want to help answer what are the optimal practice patterns? How should patients be followed? What kind of specialization mixes uh, should our oncologists be working on? And also, what's the optimal capacity to balance that supply and demand, also considering downstream work? And then for our, the last aspect, uh, this is probably an area that some of you are more interested in. We also need to look at what's the minimum and maximum number of cases an oncologist should see each year. We want them to see a minimum number so they retain their proficiency in their designated tumor groups. And we also want to make sure that they're not seeing too many cases where it's affecting the quality of care and putting patient safety at risk. And then we also have to ask when and how should patients transition to survivorship programs? And this is a very important question because when patients transition to these survivorship programs, what it does is it's, um, it's freeing up additional capacity for oncologists and making it easier for them to be able to treat new patients. And so, the work that we've completed to date is that we've kind of looked at these uh, two sides of the slide separately. So we started a problem to look at the new patient wait times, and then we've also worked on a separate problem for downstream workload. However, in our future research, we want to look at this as a system perspective and consider and try and find an equilibrium between the two sides. So for the rest of the presentation, you're going to see lots of graphs and lots of numbers. But at the end of the day, there's three main takeaways that we'd like you to get out of this presentation. And the first is that you can use advanced analytical methods to make better decisions and solve complex problems, such as operations research techniques. The second one is that the ability to see new patients in a timely manner is an important problem. And this is something that's difficult for us to quantify because we work on more of the operations and business side. Uh, and we're not really, it's difficult for us to quantify the effect of uh, patient health outcomes. However, we know it's an important problem because if patients have longer wait times to see an oncologist, their condition could potentially worsen during this time, their tumors could grow, and it's uh, also stressful for the patients to wait and not know what's going to come next. But lastly, the most important takeaway is that we have to take a system perspective when approaching this problem. We can't just look at uh, new patient wait times in isolation because increasing capacity to see these new patients in a timely manner adds downstream work. However, if too much downstream work then makes it harder to see new patients in a timely manner. So as I said, our case study today was done at the BC Cancer Agency. And the BC Can Cancer Agency is a provincial agency uh, made up of six regional cancer centers. And our study focused specifically on the Center for the Southern Interior, which is located in Kelowna, British Columbia. And as I alluded to earlier, the motivation for the study was that an executive came to us and said that they were experiencing very long wait times for new patient consultations with medical oncologists. And in addition to that, they were also having to work patients into their schedules, uh, especially for the most urgent patients, when they couldn't be seen within those maximum recommended wait times. And this was adding overtime to the oncologist's workday, as well as making it difficult to manage the daily schedule. 
And so you can see from our graph here, this represents the median wait time from referral to new patient consultations. So there's a few things that happen be in between this process. We're mostly concerned with the total time from when the patient enters the system to when they actually be begin their consultation. So the green bar in the graph represents the median wait times in Kelowna, and the red bars represent uh, the Vancouver median wait time, and the line represents the uh, median for all of BCCA. So as you can see from this graph, uh, for Kelowna compared to all of BCCA, the median wait times are a lot longer, and this was the problem that we began to look at. And so here's a typical cancer patient's pathway uh, within the BCCA, and I'm sure it's most uh, quite similar in other centers throughout Canada. Uh, but it all begins outside the BCCA with diagnosis, and then they're referred, and then after the referral process, uh, they go through some sort of triage. And during the triage process, what we're looking at is determining the patient's urgency level. So for the purposes of our study, the most urgent patients are considered to be urgency level one, and the least urgent patients are considered urgency level four. So we go from urgency level one to urgency level four. In addition to that, we also have to figure out, well, the physicians have to figure out if there's any additional tests that are required and what has to be done before the first consultation. Once that's all complete, the patient can be booked for their first uh, consult. They then have that consult with the oncologist, and then most likely they're going to start some form of chemotherapy treatment. And so as you can see, during their chemotherapy, they're going to have a number of follow-up visits. And then post-treatment, they also need to have some follow up visits with the oncologist as well. And then at some point, depending on the tumor group, the physician, or the standard practice, they're going to be discharged to the community where they may be seen by an alternative care provider such as a nurse practitioner or maybe a general practitioner uh, physician who specializes in oncology. And so for the problem here, we have certain levers that we can control. And the first one is demand management. And it may not seem that likely that we can control demand because it would seem that pretty much any patient that's referred to the BCCA has to be treated uh, there. However, uh, one of the executives brought up when we were approaching this problem was that it might be possible to divert some of the least urgent demand, which we would be uh, considered to be urgency level four, to maybe a um, general physician who specializes in oncology or some other specialist uh, outside of the BCCA in order to reduce our demand. And so that's one thing that we ended up looking at. We also wanted to look at the booking rules and figure out the most efficient way to conduct patient appointment scheduling. So we're using our resources as efficiently as we can. And then we want to look at capacity management. And these are things such as how many oncologists do we need, what's the optimal number of new patient slots that each oncologist should have, and then at what point do we discharge these patients to the community to free up additional capacity for our medical oncologists? So here's a challenge that we face with this problem, as it's a quite complicated problem. First of all, uh, the demand is highly variable. We don't know how many patients are going to arrive for referral each day. We don't know what tumor groups they're going to have. And then we also don't know what their urgency level is going to be. And as I mentioned earlier, we do have multiple urgency levels um, to consider. Then we have to look at the capacity side. And uh, medical oncologists is a very expensive resource in healthcare. And we also have a limited amount and a limited number of new patient spots with which they can treat, have their new patient consultations. In addition to that, each oncologist has a certain set of tumor groups or tumor sites that they specialize in. And sometimes it's difficult to ensure that these the specializations of our oncologists is matching the distribution of the tumor groups that we see come in with demand. And so there's a number of managerial levers or strategies that we can try in order to try and match demand and capacity. And I'll go into those in a little bit more detail later on. However, as I mentioned, one of our operations research techniques is simulation, and that's the one we selected for this study. So what is simulation? It essentially lets us build a model of the actual system. And the reason that we do that is because we're not necessarily interested in the actual system as it is. What we want to try and do is experiment with different strategies and configurations in order to see what happens to the system without making actual changes. And there's a number of reasons for this. First, it can be very expensive to make those changes. 
Uh, second of all, they can be very uh, impractical or complicated to make. And then we also, it's going to take a very long time to um, see the results um, from the study. So if we ran an experiment, we might have to wait one, two, or even three or four years to see what happens to the system when we make those changes. However, with simulation, we can build a model that represents the actual system. We can make different configuration changes, strategies in our model, and then we can run the simulation very quickly, and then we can see what happens to the system. So we call these what-if scenarios. In our example picture, this would be an example of a simulation for passengers going through airport security. And so a typical what-if scenario for this situation would be, well, what if we add an extra x-ray machine? What, how much is that going to improve our system performance? And it's it, basically we can determine if that change is worth it without having to invest in an additional machine. So here are some of the what-if scenarios we looked at for our uh, CSI study. And the first thing that we looked at were the booking rules. So overall, we ended up looking at six different booking rules, but the main two ones I'm going to be discussing today are what we call first come, first serve, and first available slot. And I'm going to go more into detail on those a little bit later on. Next, we looked at how to handle uh, overtime for the oncologist in the form of add-on patients. What should the policy be? Should we allow uh, the oncologist to use add-ons as needed for all patients so that, so that all patients can be seen within their maximum recommended wait time? Or should we reserve add-ons for the most urgent patients only? Then we can also consider, well, what happens if we don't use add-ons at all? How will that will affect patient wait times and what happens to the system? Then we can also test what happens if we divert the demand. So we can look at diverting the least urgent patients and compare that to the current system where we're not um, diverting any patients and compare if the benefit from that change uh, might be worth experimentation in practice. And lastly, we can adjust capacity. We can determine um, how many slots should be assigned to each oncologist and to what oncologist should we add extra slots to. So what we were able to do with the simulation model is try different combinations of all these scenarios together and to see which were the best performing ones overall. So here's an animation that basically represents what our simulation model looks like. So when patients arrive to the system, we consider patient arrival to be the point at which their triage process is complete and they're ready to be booked. So as they arrive to our system, we're going to assign them a tumor group and urgency level, and that's based off of the uh, historical distribution that they saw in Kelowna. So for this example here, this patient is going to be in the breast tumor group, and they're going to be in urgency level one. So we go into our uh, oncologist calendar, and we find an oncologist that mat that treats the uh, breast tumor group, and we look for any available slots to schedule that patient to. And so we'll assign that patient in our simulation. When the next patient arrives, uh, we assign them a tumor group of melanoma, and they're urgency level four. So let's say, for example, in this uh, configuration of our simulation model, we are choosing to divert the least urgent patients. So in this case, that patient would not be booked uh, to our oncologist calendar. And then our last example patient is in the GU tumor group and their urgency level two. So again, we look in our oncologist calendar, we see that there's only one oncologist that specializes in GU, but they have no available slots within that patient's maximum recommended wait times. So what we need to do is add this patient on to that oncologist schedule uh, and work them into a slot uh, in any way that we can. And so what we're able to do is we're able to run this simulation for five years. So we run it for 260 appointment days per year. And we ended up just looking at the middle three years to account for some warm-up and termination in the system. And then once that's all complete, we can repeat this whole process 30 times. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to compare uh, certain performance metrics to see how each configuration performs. And here's the performance metrics that we looked at for our simulation model. And the first is service level. And service level is the percentage of patients who are seen within their maximum recommended wait times. So we looked at the overall service level, and we also looked at the service level for each urgency level. Then we also looked at the number of add-ons. So we looked at how many add-ons uh, were added to each oncologist's calendar each week during the simulation. 
And then we looked at the new patient slot utilization. So this is what percentage of new patient slots are we actually are actually being utilized or scheduled. And so for these performance metrics, um, we have to consider that um, we looked at three overall because we had to consider the trade-off between them. For example, if we added a lot of new patient, add a lot of capacity, uh, it could result in a very low number of add-ons but it would also result in low new patient slot utilization. And so for service level, we want that number to be very high. That would be our target. For the number of atoms, we want that to be as low as possible because atoms are disruptive to the oncologist schedule. And we want our new patient slot utilization to be very high, but not necessarily at 100% uh, because we need some wiggle room for that uh, for certain scenarios. So now I'm going to talk about some of the results of the simulation model. And the first uh, thing that we looked at was what was the best booking policy. So we looked at uh, two different performance metrics, which I'm going to show here, and that was average weekly add-ons, and we also looked at new patient slot utilization. So the two policies uh, that we ended up deciding between were the first come first serve policy, which is the current policy that they're using in Kelowna, and that essentially means that as uh, patients arrive into the system, they're ready to be booked. They're just booked to the earliest available slot with oncologists that specialize in that tumor group as they arrive into the system. The other policy that we were considering um, was first available slot. And this is extremely similar to first come, first serve, but the main difference is now that we are collecting all referrals until the end of the day, and then we're booking them starting with the most urgent patients first and working our way down to the least urgent patients. And so you can see from our graphs, as I said, we want our average weekly add-ons to be as low as possible. So you can see the red and the blue line are very similar in this graph, and they're also the, the lowest out of all the other policies that we tried. And for new page slot utilization, again, the blue and the red line are very similar, um, but you can see that... Um, we ended up choosing the first available slot policy for a specific reason, and that was because it was reserving capacity on a daily basis for the most urgent patients. And so that was one of our recommendations based on the simulation model. The next question we were trying to answer is, what was the right number of new patient slots that we should add um, for each week in Kelowna? And the performance metrics that we looked at here where service level and new patient slot utilization. And so you can see on the x-axis there, we're comparing the current number of slots that they're using versus what happens if we add uh, one to eight additional slots per week. And so if you look at the service level graph, what we're most interested in is, is where is the slope of the line the steepest? Because that means for each additional slot that we're adding, we're getting the biggest improvement in our overall service level. However, as I said, we have to consider the trade-off, because if we add slots, if we go all the way up to eight slots here, we're going to be close to 100% service level, but we're going to have extremely low utilization. So we had to look at two performance metrics for this. And so you can see what happens here when we go from uh, three to five additional slots. You can see that our utilization drops off quite a bit there. So in the end, we ended up just deciding to recommend that they add four additional slots for their oncologist calendar per week in order to balance the trade-off between service level and new patient slot utilization. Next, we looked at the patient diversion policy. Should we uh, see all patients within the BCCA, or should we divert the least urgent patients to uh, alternative care providers? And so here, we're looking at service level, and we're also looking at the average weekly add-on. And I just want to comment that when we divert the least urgent patients, this results in approximately 7% uh, of new patients being diverted to other practitioners. So the pink line in our graph for service level represents the case where we are diverting the least urgent patients, and the blue line represents where we're seeing all patients within the BCCA. And so you can see essentially this graph shifts from the right side to the left side. So this means for reducing our number of new patient slots by two, we're achieving the same overall service level. And then if we look at add-ons, 
Again, the blue line is we're treating all, we're seeing all patients from BCCA, and the pink is we're diverting least urgent patients. For the same number of additional new patient slots, our number of add-ons is reduced from about 2.75 down to 1. So that's a quite a significant reduction for the average weekly add-on. So what this means is if uh, Kelowna decided that they wanted to divert these urgent patients, instead of having to add four additional slots, they would only need to add two. And then the next question that we looked at was, would it be possible to improve the specialization mixes of the ecologists in the practice? And this question right now is a little bit more theoretical than practical because um, in practice it's actually difficult to add a new specialty for the oncologist. Uh, there takes some time for them to learn about the new tumor group and they're also, they also have a lot of time invested in the other tumor groups that they're working on. However, it's an interesting question and it does have some practical applications such as if you are hiring an additional oncologist, what should their specialties be? So here in this graph, our y-axis represents the percentage of new patient slots that are not utilized and the x-axis represents the average weekly add-on. And so as we get higher along the y-axis, this means that we have lots of excess capacity in the form of slots not utilized in our system. And then when we go along the x-axis, uh, this means that we have a lot of overtime in our system because we're having a high number of, average, of weekly add-ons into the calendar. So we compared the pink line, which are the current specialties in the CSI, and then we tried altering the specialties with, with revised specialties. And that would be, what if we added GI to one oncologist and we added uh, maybe lymphoma to a different oncologist? What would happen to the system? So you can see from this graph that the ideal point you want to be at is at zero, zero. This means you have no slots in utilize and you have no add-ons. So you want to get as close to that point as possible. So you can see as we go from the pink line, our current specialties, to the blue line, which are the revised specialties, we get closer to this ideal point. And so that would be an improvement over the current specialties that they're using. Again, this is a little bit more theoretical at this point, but it does have some interesting implications uh, for the future planning. So based on the results of our simulation model, uh, we provided certain recommendations to CSI. And we ended up providing two different alternatives. And really the alternatives differ in the, whether or not we are diverting the least urgent patients, which is a strategic decision that ne they need to carefully consider and make. However, uh, the first alternative would be if they did not divert any patients. They we would recommend, based on our simulation model, that they would need to add four extra new patient slots per week. We'd also recommend that they would use fast booking uh, by booking patients to the first available slot and decreasing urgency level. And then for the add-on policy, which I didn't uh, talk about too much, but we determined the best policy from the simulation model would be to allow uh, add-ons for all urgency levels. And this would result in approximately 1.1 add-ons per week. An alternative to this would be if they chose to divert the least urgent patients. Now they would only need to add two extra new patient slots each week, and they would use fast booking to book patients to the first available slot and decreasing urgency level. Uh, the add-on policy would be the same, but it would result in an average of one add-on per week. So the add-ons overall are pretty low. And since we are using add-ons, I do want to comment that this does result in 100% service level. So all of the patients will be seen within their maximum recommended wait times. And our expected new patient slot utilization will be around 96%. So these are the recommendations we made to Kelowna based on our simulation model. But then, as I alluded to earlier, we also have to consider the downstream work. So what, ha what effect does adding these extra slots or altering an oncologist's specialization mix have on downstream oncologist workload? And my colleague, Emma Liu, is going to talk to you about that uh, problem. Thanks, Leah. So besides new patient limitations, as mentioned before, another big chunk of oncologist time is spent on following with the existing patients. And if we add new, more new patient slots to the oncologist, that means the future practice size of this oncologist will increase, which for sure will translate into higher future workload. So in order to decide what is the optimal number of new patients that the oncologist should see per week, we first need to understand how much downstream workload a new patient is likely to generate. In order to do that, we 
conducted a data analysis using 10-year follow-up form information from the BCCA information system. And then we summarized and estimated patient's follow-up demand and also, the, also patient's duration of stay by tumor site. We recognize that uh, besides tumor site, there may be other factors that could impact, that could have impact on follow-up demand. For example, patient's uh, stage of disease, their age, or medical oncology preferences, or even the common follow-up practice at the time. But for this preliminary analysis, we only focus on characterizing follow-up demand by tumor site. And then utilizing the outcome from our data analysis, we developed a tool that, en that enables users to experiment with different practice patterns and specialization mixes. Next, I'll briefly talk about our data set and how we estimated patient demand for follow-up appointments and their duration of stay. In our data set, we have over 8,000 patients with single cancer sets who had their new patient consults with a medical oncologist at Kelowna from 1999 to 2011. And this 13 years gives us 13 cohorts of patients with each cohort had their new patient consults in each year. Taking breast cancer as an example, this table gives the number of patients in each cohort, and we can see here, for the 1999 cohort, we had 13 years of follow-up information. Well, for the 2011 cohort, we only had one year of follow-up information available. The first column of this table shows the number of patients in each cohort, and if we look at each cohort a long time, these numbers show how many patients are there each year after their new patient consult. For example, if you look at the 1999 cohort, there's 109 patients uh, who had their, uh, there are 109 patients who had their new patient consult in 1999, and 107 of them survived the first year after their new patient consult, and 102 of them survived the uh, first two years after their new patient consult, and so on. So this table gave us the group of patients that were in the system who generated or could have generated follow-up follow -up workload for the oncologist. And similarly, we summarized the number of follow-up appointments for each new patient appointment year and each year after the new patient appointment. If we take the sum of each column from the patient table, that gives us the number of patients who were there who could have generated follow-up workload. And if we sum up the, each column of the follow-up table, that gives, gives us the number of follow-up appointments they generated. Then, if we divide the number of follow-up appointments by number of patients in each year, that gives us the estimated average number of follow-up appointments each year after new patient consult. Since we only have limited number of patients to estimate for the, uh, for the demand from year 11 to year 13, we decided to only estimate the demand and patient series of stay for the first 10 years after the new patient consult. So we did the same calculation for all tumor sites. The first outcome of our data analysis is the conditional death rate table showing the conditional death rate of each year after the new patient consult for different tumor site. As we can see here, the conditional death rates for different tumor sites are quite different. For example, for breast cancer patients, 4% of them uh, died in the first year after new patient consult, and comparing to lung cancer patients, where 57% of them are deceased within the first year after, after their initial new patient consult. In the second year, 4% of the survived, uh, of the breast cancer patients who survived the first year after a new patient consult are deceased in the second year, comparing to lung cancer patients. 38% of the lung cancer patients who survived the first year are deceased in the second year. Again, the estimates for year 8 to year 10 are more noisy due to the limited number of patients we had, especially for some of the more rare cancer sites. Another output from our data analysis is a table showing the estimated average number of follow-up appointments each year after new patient consults for different tumor sites. Again, we can see here the estimated number are quite different across tumor sites, and we identified the top three tumor sites that generated the most follow-up workload. Those are breast cancer, gastrointestinal cancer, and lymphoma. Since the number of patients in each tumor site are different, we took the weighted average 
of the number of follow appointments each year after new patient consult. So on this, on this graph, the x-axis shows the time after new patient consult from year one to year 10. On the y-axis, it shows the weighted average count of follow-up appointments per patient in each year. We can see here most of the follow-up workloads were generated in the first year after new patient consult, which averaged to around 3.6 follow-up appointments per patient. And this number goes down to around 0.5 follow-up appointments per patient at year 10. And utilizing these two tables, the uh, data analysis outcomes, we build a capacity management tool that we call Oncologist Capacity Manager. It's an Excel-based tool for the users to experiment with different practice configurations. The goal of this tool, the goal of this tool is to quantitatively evaluate the impact of different patterns of practices uh, and the different specialization mixes on oncologists' annual workloads and their practice sizes. Since we only estimated patients' duration of stay or conditional death rate and their demand for follow-up appointments for 10 years, our model horizon was 10 years. And we assume that all patients are followed until death. We realize that in real life, after treatment and after several follow-up appointments, some patients are discharged uh, back into the community and they may or may not come back to the cancer agency, depending on if there's a relapse of disease. And some patients actually follow until death. And then for modeling purposes here, we assume that all patients are following to death, and this assumption is supported by the model inputs, which are the two tables we just saw, uh, the conditional death rate and the follow-up appointment demand estimates. To use the tool, the users can design their own scenarios by controlling the oncology specialization mixes and the number of new patients the oncology sees every year and also the percentage of workload that can be diverted to alternative care provider. The tool takes all these inputs, the user input it, and then compute and summarize the predicted number of follow-up appointments in the first 10 years of the oncologist's practice, and also the predicted pr practice size for this medical oncologist. So for each model run, the tool takes the uh, user's inputs and uh, generates or simulates a group of new patients and assign the patients with a tumor site. And also decide on if the patient will be diverted to alternative care provider. All these decisions are based on the parameters that the user input is. And if the, if the patient is not diverted to alternative care provider, then they will go through a set patient path uh, as indicated by the data analysis results. Each year, they have a probability of exiting the system, and if they stay in the system, they will keep generating uh, the set number of follow-up appointments each year. At the same time, the tool keeps track of all the patient paths and then summarize and sum up the number of follow-up appointments that are generated each year for this oncologist, and also the practice size in terms of how many patients are there under the practice each year after, uh, after the oncologist started the practice. Next, I will go through a couple of scenarios that we tested with the tool. The first scenario looks at the impact of different specialization mixes. Consider two medical oncologists with different specializa specializations. Oncologist one does, uh, spends 90% of the new patient's loss in seeing breast cancer patients and 10% on head and neck patients. Oncologist 2 spends 70% of the new patient consult on genital urinary cancer patients and 20% uh, on lung cancer, 10% on breast cancer. Remember that all these tumor sites uh, patients have very different conditional death rates each year and they have very different demand for follow-up appointments. And we'll assume that uh, both oncologists see the same number of new patients per year. And uh, given this input, we can use the tool to compare what's the uh, predicted follow-up workload and what's the predicted practice size for this oncologist. So the first opposite tool is a graph. On the x side, on the x axis is the time of this uh, of the first 10 years of the oncologist practices. And on the y axis is the number of follow-up appointments each year generated uh, in the first 10 years of the practice. And, I, and the red line represents oncologist 2, the blue line represents oncologist 1. 
as we can see here, even though the specialization matrix of these two oncologists are very different, the predicted number of follow-up work uh, follow-up appointments of these oncologists are quite similar in the first 10 years of their of their practices. With oncologists with oncologists one ending up with a slightly higher follow-up workload at the 10th year of their practices. The tool also compares the predicted practice size of these oncologists. Again, the x-axis shows the time, the first 10 years of these practices, and the y-axis shows how many patients are there under the practices. We can see here oncologists one at the 10th year of the practice will end up with a much higher practice size compared to oncologists two. This is mainly because oncologists one focused on breast cancer patients who had a much longer survival time compared to other cancer size patients. So we can see here users can actually use this tool to test the combination of uh, of uh, uh, oncology specializations and uh, different practice patterns and to test the impact of these uh, practice patterns on future workload and practice size. Now we go back to the question, what if we add a new patient slot per week to an oncologist? So in, in this scenario, we have, a, uh, we, have selected an we have selected an oncologist and increased the new patient slot of this oncologist from three to four per week. And then we run the model, and now the blue line is, shows the predicted number of follow-up appointments before adding the new patient slot, and the red line shows what happens after we add a new patient slot. We can see here, uh, if, uh, in the first 10 years of this oncologist practices, adding one new patient slot means that the oncologist need to see an extra 400 follow-up appointments at the 10th year of the practice. And this 400 follow-up appointments plus the one new patient per week will translate into 248 clinic hours. And looking at this graph, we can see here at the beginning of this practice, it is actually feasible for the oncologist to see four new patients per week. But as time goes on, if the oncologist continues, if the oncologist is constantly seeing four new patients per week, the practice will slowly become unsustainable. This is an interesting question that we would like to address in future research. That is, when is the optimal time that the oncologist should start decreasing their new patient intake in order to maintain a sustainable practice? And we can see here that adding one new patient slot per week to this selected oncologist will result in an extra 330 patients uh, in, under the oncologist practice at the 10th year. In the first part of, of our analysis, another insight or recommend, recommendation we came up with is adding new patient slot and diverting the least urgent new patients. Given the specialization mix of this oncologist, that means uh, we are diverting around 10.2% of the new patients. Now we run the model again uh, with the blue line representing before adding new patient slots, red line meaning after adding new patient slots and diverting the least urgent patients. We can see here now adding one new patient slot wouldn't result in such a big difference from before. Now you will only end up with, the oncologist will only end up with extra 98 clinic hours at the 10th year of the practice. Similarly, we compare the uh, impact of adding new patient slots and diverting new uh, least urgent patients, uh, on the impact on practice size. We can see here by adding new patients and diverting least urgent patients, the practice size will increase by around 100 patients at the 10th year of the practice. And the last scenario we tested is changing oncology specialization. Assume that oncology does uh, 144 new patient appointment each year, and we added gastrointestinal can uh, cancer into the pie chart. By changing specialization mix, here the red line represents after changing specialization, and blue line represents before changing the specialization. We can see that Oncologist predicted workload actually decreased from before. And if we look at the pre predicted practice size of this oncologist, we can see here by adding gastrointestinal into the, into the pie chart, the, uh, 
the predicted practice size will actually decrease as well at the 10th year of oncologist practice. So besides using this tool to compare two different practices or compare the practice of two different oncologists, we can also use this tool to do capacity planning for the whole center if we aggregated demand and aggregate, aggregated capacity. So assume that the given, assume the given capacity medical oncologist capacity at, at Kelowna and also assume the given new patients from the last and next 10 years. Assume we use the same follow-up patterns that we estimated from the data analysis. Assume 20% of the follow-up work is diverted to alternative care provider, which is the current situation at the cancer center. And new patient consultation takes 90 minutes, follow-up takes 30. Our analysis predicts that the pro projected clinical workload will exceed the capacity of oncologist time at year 2016. And the management may, may consider either adding more capacity or diverting part of the demand in order to uh, have, have the two sites meet. For the next steps, we've submitted a grant under CIHR and uh, we plan to generalize our analysis to include all BCC centers and looking at a longer time period, more than 10 years, maybe 20 years. And uh, we also want to incorporate the radiation part into the story. And in this preliminary analysis, we only examine the variability in follow-up demand between tumor sites. In the future, we would like to also look at the variability in follow-up demand across oncologist types of cancer regions or even over time. Then we would like to compare what, like, what actually happens with the follow-up guidelines indicated by BCCA policies. And then using a more detailed data analysis, we'll be able to build a provincial or more comprehensive level model to evaluate different patterns of practices and different fertilization, fertilization mixes. And then we'll study different new patient booking process at different centers and look for the best booking rule for different centers. And now in this analysis, we're looking at new patient booking and the follow-up demand separately in uh, using two analysis. We can see here the new patient booking is studied on a daily basis, while, while the uh, follow-up is studied on an annual basis. And in the future, we'd like to explore the possibility to combine these two parts together and build a system level model and eventually create a framework to support decision makers in making evidence-based decisions in capacity planning. After this presentation, I hope you can see that one can use advanced analytical methods, such as operations research, to guide evidence-based decision-making decision and also help solving complex business problems. And operations research is applied in many different industries. Our team, the RX team, specialized in applying operates research in healthcare, in particular cancer care. So if you have any questions or if you have a business problem that you think that can be solved with our technique, with our expertise, then uh, please contact us or we'll be able to we'll be happy to help. The problem under this study, the ability ability to see new patients in a timely manner is a very important one. But to approach this problem we must take a system perspective because the ability to see new patients in a timely manner both generates and is constrained by downstream workload. And thank you for your time and attention uh, that wraps our presentation. Uh, if you have any questions or if you uh, are interested in collaborating in the future, please contact us. This is our kind of information.